Well, thank you guys for joining us. Uh, those of you that came to join Startup Grind, it's a pleasure to have all of you guys here. We've got John Kerber, the CEO of Who's On My Wi-Fi. I think you guys are in for quite a treat tonight. So for those of you that haven't gotten a chance to get introduced, my name's Alex Lobodiak. I do business development for a software company, Geosafe, and uh, do some consulting on the side as well as uh, do some philanthropic stuff with Chris, and that's how I got involved with Startup Grind. And John, I've, I've had the pleasure of meeting him at several of these events, whether it's Startup Grind or Startup OKC or this or that. And so John's a great person that we're really excited to have with us tonight. He's done some great things with the startup community, and he's uh, here to tell us a little bit more about himself, some of his experiences, and hopefully you guys can learn a bit from from us, and uh, without any further ado, let's give John a nice startup grind welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah appreciate it. Pleasure. pleasure to have you here. John, for those of us that haven't got a chance to really meet you, can you tell us a little bit about your background and what brought you here? Sure. Uh, so yeah, so I'm the co-founder of Who's on My Wi-Fi. Uh, we're a Wi-Fi analytics company here in Oklahoma City. Uh, for those of you who don't know what Wi-Fi analytics is, it's basically uh, kind of like tracking physical spaces, people moving around physical spaces using Wi-Fi. Uh, so it really kind of helps spaces improve uh, based on knowing how long people are staying, how long people are returning, things like that. Think about it like in a mall. Right, so you know, are people going back to the store? Are they spending a lot of time in this store or another store? That's that's really kind of what we do. Great. So, what's your educational background like? Sure. Uh, so, I graduated with a computer science degree from Loyola University Chicago, um, a long time ago now, yeah. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. And then you decided to <clears throat> come down to Oklahoma. Uh, so I'm from Oklahoma. I uh, I'm actually I was actually born in Tuttle, Oklahoma. You know, so just uh, okay. yeah, 20 minutes outside of Moore. And uh, I actually left uh, I left Tuttle to go to Loyola Chicago. I was there for a few years. I actually uh, taught English in Japan for a few years. And then uh, my brother was starting this tiny little company called Paycom. At the, or he wasn't starting it. He he, uh, he was. Uh, one of the early, very early people, like the original tech person there, uh, and he asked me to come back and kind of work there, and I was like, yeah, sure, okay, uh, you seem a little stressed, and <laughs> there's a lot going on, and uh, sure, yeah, I'll come back, and so that's what actually brought me back to Oklahoma from Japan was, uh, he was working on Paycom, and I was like, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll come help. Great, so, uh, you know, a lot of people have heard of Paycom, some people haven't. Uh, Paycom's another kind of big name in the startup industry around here. Yeah. So it's kind of neat you got to have some experience learning on someone else's dime before starting your own. That's right. Yeah, I was I was like employee number 10, I guess, when I when I got there. It was really small. I, I kind of always joke it was back behind the Hooters and you know, it was, it was a really small company at the time. Um, and yeah, I mean, I got there and there were 10 of us and I left and there were about 800. So it was, it was pretty crazy. I got there right for the, the rapid growth, kind of pre-IPO rapid growth, which was really exciting. Yeah, I bet that was certainly <laughs> something to, to write home about. Um, yeah, so what, what type of experiences did you take with you from Paycom to Who's On My Wi-Fi? Um, you know, I, uh, it's funny, I haven't actually talked much about Paycom, you know, because I, I kind of said I wouldn't really say too much, but I've been gone for about six years, so it's, it's fine. Yeah. Um, but. But the culture there was really fascinating, right? And, and probably still is very fascinating. Um, you know, I'd, I'd worked at other companies before, uh, you know, just in college and, and before that. Um, Paycom has a very strong work ethic, like a like a very, you know, intense. We we are going to succeed, and and uh, it's really fascinating because you know, uh, I mean, imagine this was back in 2004 when I came back. Um, you know, there was no startup community. There was no, there wasn't really a lot of like tech culture and startup culture here, uh, and you know at the same time, you know when there were ten or fifteen of us there, uh, we were already talking about it going public, right? So you got, you got to imagine it's <clears throat> a very very tiny company, and it it already kind of had that that uh, culture that that's what was going to happen, right? And so uh, j yeah, really fascinating, and and yeah, I've definitely taken that with me uh, running Kuzo on my Wi-Fi, which is just kind of the. Um, work very hard, can continuously work at it. Uh, it's never perfect, keep going. That's great, that's great. So uh, your 
you know, I, I think there's kind of a misconception that school always prepares everyone for everything, but I'm sure that's, there's certainly some truth to that. I'm sure you took some of those experiences that you learned at Loyola and uh, uh, are using those now. Um, did you learn a lot on the job as well? And so some people, you know, kind of say college is kind of like a waste of time and everything. For me, it wasn't. I uh, I didn't really know how to program, like not really when I uh, went to college. So I I dabbled a little bit, knew knew some basics, but um, I really learned how to code and code well uh, at school, getting a computer science degree. And also, what's pretty standard with computer science is I didn't learn one language. I learned like seven in four years right wow. and so you just you just kind of have to and uh, that's just what it is and uh, so yeah I actually learned a lot at Loyola and that's how I really learned how to program I was also uh, doing an internship while I was at school um, and it was a, a company called MedPoint they're still around um, you know they do kind of like B2B pharmaceutical sales and I was doing originally just IT work for them and then I started doing programming as I got better at programming uh, yeah, so so I learned a lot <clears throat> in school, but also, <clears throat> pardon, uh, at work while in school. That's great. So was there a defining moment when you decided, all right, I'm ready to make the jump and start doing my own thing? Oh, man. Um, no, no. <laughs> There's no real defining moment. I mean, um, you know, I... I had wanted to start my company or, or a company for a very long time. I uh, actually, when I was back in Japan, uh, you know, I was teaching English there, and of, of course, I uh, built a product that was like, you know, teaching online with Skype and, and all that kind of stuff, right? And uh, so I, I always like to build things, right? And I'd, I'd like to for a long time. And uh, going to Paycom was was just more fuel for the entrepreneurial fire, right? I mean, seeing um, you know Chad and and William are also both from Tuttle, right? So, so really, just you know, my brother and, and uh, uh, his friend's brother, uh, you know, kind of coming from a small town, building something really pretty impressive. I mean, it, it is you know just made me want to be an entrepreneur even more, right? And so, um, so yeah, I mean, even after um, after only even being there, I think about three or four years was the first time I told Chad, like, uh, yeah, I think I think I'm gonna go start my own company. Of course, he laughed because he'd done it and he knew how hard it was yeah. gonna be, right? So. Um, but yeah. So but before we get into your vision about starting Who's on My Wi-Fi, yeah. I want to hear a little bit more about your experience in Japan. That sure. sounds exciting. Um, yeah, I mean, I was, uh, it's, it's really funny because uh, I, was, I was working at MedPoint. I was uh, uh, graduating from college and from Loyola. And I, I just kind of, I saw like the, the um, IT track ahead of me, right? Like the, the next 10 years. And I just didn't want to do it. I wanted to do something different. And so uh, a friend of mine was uh, uh, going to Japan and, and she told me about it. I was like, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll do the same thing. And uh, hilariously, I wanted to be in Tokyo and, and she wanted to be in uh, Osaka and Kyoto. And so that's what she requested and I requested Tokyo and we got flipped. Somehow I ended up in, <laughs> in Osaka and she ended up in Tokyo, but you know, it's just, just what it is, right? So uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it was it was really nice. I I uh, like travel. I like learning new things, and and spending time in Japan was great. That's great. So, uh, what type of vision did you go into with Who's on My Wi-Fi, and uh, maybe has that vision changed since you originally started? Or yes, <laughs> yeah. yes. Um, you know, what vision did I have for the company uh, launching back in 2012? Um, you know, I really had no idea what it was actually going to um, to be like to, to run a company, especially to run a company full time. Uh, it is it is very different being nights and weekends, and it's kind of a hobby, uh, or even learning about business books or, or, or something like that. And then, okay, this is how you're actually going to make money, continue all that. I mean, that that is that leap is definitely a leap. Uh, and yeah, so so the vision I think I had was, oh yeah, we'll probably be hugely successful within a year, and that was not the case. <laughs> that was not the case at all. Um, also, I I was trying to start kind of a company that could could be run from anywhere. Um, you know, tried to uh, run it from Edinburgh, Scotland, and that really didn't work because we had American customers that were calling me at three in the morning, and <laughs> you know, uh, and with a with a young baby that d just didn't work at all. And so moved back to Oklahoma and. Uh, found a co-working space, the 404, and found a lot of other like-minded people, other, other entrepreneurs. It was just like, okay, this this is kind of the right place to, to do this. And 
and yeah, but it's, I think it's been a really good decision to be in Oklahoma and build a company from here. That's great. So what was, what was it like getting your first customer? Yeah, um, you know, I, I was speaking to some of the people in the audience here. Uh, a lot of them are accomplished entrepreneurs have actually, you know, kind of done this. But uh, yeah, I mean, the first dollar that you don't quote unquote work for, kind of like your head explodes. <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, I'll, I'll never forget the, because uh, back in the day, who's on my Wi Fi was selling a software, um, you know, for $50 or something like just the software. Now that software is free and we, we charge for an online service. But, um, you know, and, and I remember seeing it and it was like, whoa, that's, that's crazy that I built something uh, and somebody actually paid me just for the thing I built, not to, to spend hours working on. That's great. So I'm sure a lot of people here have had that same experience and very excited about it. And then uh, how did things evolve from there? Sure. Um, so Who's On My Wi-Fi had a very uh, kind of up and down trajectory, uh, you know, as a company. So, you know, we, we started off, uh, you know, really just wanted to know if, if you're monitoring a network, if you kind of knew which devices were on a network, a wireless network over time, what could you find out? What could that tell you? And didn't really have much more of a plan than that. Uh, it turned out that a lot of people found it interesting from a security standpoint, right? So we kind of added some features about, you know, letting you know if an unknown device showed up on your network. And so we actually grew, um, you know, in the security space for probably the first two or three years. Uh, and, and you know, it was challenging, but we kept, we kept going. We kind of kept, you know, adding features, um, adding things people wanted, and, and we were still charging, but noticed a lot of problems, right? So for one thing, um, charging for a one-time downloadable software that people were then keeping for three, four years is basically a way to bankruptcy, <laughs> right? Because the support continues, that people continually kind of want want new versions or want updates, they have questions about it because they're using it, but they're not continuing to pay you, right? So that, that was a real issue. So what I noticed was, um, and it, it took about a year or two before I realized this was happening, um, we kept making the same amount of money every month, right? But our customers, our total customers were increasing logarithmically, right? So if we added 50 customers a month, then at the end of 12 months, we now have 600 customers that are asking questions, but we still made the same, whatever that is, $1,000 or something, right? So that was a real problem. And uh, recognized it, said, okay, got to do something different. Um, I'll go and, you know, we'll just create a online service. So then we'll charge like 10 or $15 a month. It was, it was still very consumer oriented. Um, so then at least, you know, whether people used it for two months or for 24 months, when they were a customer, they would be a customer, and when they were not a customer, they would not be a customer. And you know that kind of carried the support burden as well as uh, you know you could see kind of a long-term growth. Now, now it required investment a little bit, which was uh, we had to get an online site up, we had to, to do some other things, um, you know, and and so it was, it was difficult. But um, that was a that was a real thing to to learn. Um, you know, of course, through the journey, not at the beginning. That would have been nice. Um, yeah, so charging, um, charging one time for something only works if it's a consumable, right? <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, uh, don't don't build something people are going to use for years if you're only going to charge once for it. So. so move into a SaaS model, save your bacon. Well, I mean, it, it just yeah, exactly. But but just depending on the product, right? And um, you know, for for what we were doing, which was long-term monitoring, long-term analytics, all that, you know, uh, had to be a SaaS model, basically. But I mean, so many problems. I don't know how many problems you want me to talk about. <laughs> Cause, cause been... Well, you know, it, it is startup grind. So right. what we try to do is is focus maybe on some of the less rose-colored lens oh, man. things. Yeah. So um, I mean, all we did was made mistakes, you know, and, and then found ways around them. It's kind of it's kind of what it felt like, uh, you know. Um, let's see. There's there's two kinds of entrepreneurs in the world: yeah. those that admit that they make mistakes and dirty liars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, even even the whole, you know, kind of building a company from anywhere and all that, you know, had definitely been reading too many books that were, you know, you should be an entrepreneur, you should be an entrepreneur, you know, and kind of the, yeah. the, the like, success motivational type books instead of the people who had actually done it, right? And uh, uh, when I started finding people who had actually built companies, their advice was very different and uh, uh, much more realistic and kind of much more what you're probably hearing at talks like this. and. Um, so that was a big mistake. The the charging one time was a big mistake. Um, 
you know, we, we spent um, a lot of time, like 18 months building this wireless router uh, that it turned out there was almost no demand for, right? So, so spent money, spent time, really kind of wasted effort on that, uh, which was really phenomenal tech. I mean, it was just this like brilliant technology uh, that the demand just wasn't there. Uh, it turned out that we were trying to make a simple, secure router for home users, and home users really were not too excited about changing out their routers. They tend to get wireless routers from their internet company, right? So we, and then the techies, they didn't want it to be simple. They wanted it to be advanced. So we completely missed the mark, but we'd already spent 18 months of engineering building this really great product that never really had market demand, right? Which was really a problem, so. So from there, you might have pivoted away from the hardware and focused? Major pivot, yeah. So, uh, so we focused, instead of on uh, consumers and kind of simplifying security, it turned out that our technology was really good at statistics and analytics of wireless networks, right? So um, the security, you know, let's say there are um, 99 people on a network, right? And, um, but there's one guy that figures out a way to, to not be detected. In security, that's the one guy you want to know about, right? Like, it's really bad if you don't know about that one person. Um, from a statistical standpoint, if there are 99 people and you say there were 98, you, your variance was very small. You're still very accurate, and, and if, especially if it changes through the day that it goes down from like 20 in the morning to 99 in the afternoon, you, you still did a very good job, right? And so, um, so we really kind of just took a hard look at what was our product good at. Um, we actually looked at what customers were not churning, right? Because that was, that was a real problem we had, like especially in home uh, consumer security, is people would, you know, use who's on my Wi-Fi, they'd kind of pay for the service for two, three, four months, and then they'd be like, you know, my network is safe, no one's on here, I've changed my password, I feel okay, and then they'd churn, so they'd quit, right? And, and what we found was that, um, you know, city governments, banks, they tended to keep it for very long times. And so that was really more of an enterprise product. And, and we started making calls with them. It was like, well, what are you, what are you doing with it? And, and they had basically everything with uh, analysis. They wanted to do, you know, different reporting. They wanted to know what was happening with long-term trends. And that was really where we're like, okay, we can build a company on this. They also, you know, we didn't hear much from them. And so it was like, well, um, all the requests were, qu were coming from home users. So we thought, oh, let's, let's do the stuff the home users want. Uh, but it turned out that, no, I mean, the, the city government users, they were just as happy with our product. They were using it for a different reason, and they didn't really ask as many questions. So we weren't getting a lot of feature requests from them, uh, but they were actually very happy customers, right? And uh, yeah, so that's, that's kind of how we did a, a big pivot, really focused on the analytics, and uh, that's ultimately we f where we found success. So it sounds like a lot of the instances where you would have a bunch of businesses that would refresh the users on their Wi-Fi, those seem to be kind of your, your target. Yeah, so exactly. So we really went from monitoring private networks, like private you know, home and business networks, to public Wi-Fi networks. So uh, think about something at a, a public park, uh, a mall, you know, so you're using kind of public Wi-Fi. And it gives really good statistics about what people are actually there or how long are they there um, you know what is kind of the frequency are you actually busy on Saturdays are you not busy on Saturdays uh, it really gives kind of data to the anecdotal thoughts about um, what's actually happening in a space what other things does that data allow these businesses to to make decisions on sure yeah so um, there's a couple other things that are that this Wi-Fi analytics space that people are starting to do um, things like uh, when you connect to a public Wi-Fi and log in with social credentials uh, Facebook Google etc uh, you also get demographic information right so you can also see okay you know I think it is mainly um, you know females 30 to 38 that are coming in but is that really the case Right? I mean, again, it's kind of putting data to some of these anecdotal um, thoughts that people have about their space. So these businesses that are using Who's on My Wi-Fi and are pulling all this demographic data can better target their advertising and marketing campaigns? I mean, it's, it's the, you can change everything, right? So, so if, if you're mainly succeeding with females 30 to 38, you know, why does your business use certain fonts? Why do you use certain colors? Why do you have the layout this, this way? I mean, it's, it's everything. I mean, you, you think about it. Um, you know, knowing who your customer is and who you're actually satisfying uh, is, is basically the whole game, right? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you said that, knowing who your customer is and who you're satisfying is the game. Uh, it sounds like you guys certainly listened to your customers a lot when you were building new features. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about you know, maybe some stuff that you guys thought of yourself that you tested out, other stuff that maybe came from the customers and uh, how you balanced what to work on? Yeah, I, you know, um, luckily my co-founder and I are uh, friends from college, so we've known each other a really long time. So we have these quarterly business meetings, quarterly rocks and everything, and pretty much it turns into, we just kind of yell at each other till we decide what we're, what we're gonna do for the next three months, uh, which actually is really effective at kind of keeping us on track, right? So, uh, you know, I've got ideas, he's got ideas, and, and we, we list things, you know, what happened with customers, uh, what are we hearing from customers, and we, we just kind of put the whole thing into a, a, a you know, a conversation conversation and it's like, all right, this is what we actually want to do and uh, just kind of hammer it out that way, uh, which is really good because, you know, I'd, I'm definitely more on the um, product creation kind of side and he comes from more of a uh, marketing KPI kind of side. So, so you know, uh, it's, it's a good mix. It's a nice compliment. Yeah. So uh, any advice that you would give yourself six years ago when you were starting Who's on My Wi-Fi? Yeah. Um, Probably, it's gonna take longer than you think. <laughs> right? It's definitely gonna gonna be a longer, harder, you know, um, journey than you think it's gonna be. Um, six year overnight success. Yeah, six year overnight success for sure. <laughs> uh, I would definitely tell myself listen to people who have done it before, right? Like listen, you know, it doesn't mean they're right, but they probably have a better idea than people that are just kind of encouraging you or or worse selling you a product that you know is sort of like the dream right so don't not to say that that those aren't good products in and of themselves but they probably won't help you found a company that someone else is kind of selling the dream of entrepreneurship right so definitely helped their business not not your future business so i mean really if if um, i did those two probably would have knocked about a a year to a failure <laughs> off of the company so i think it's um yeah, that's probably the advice I give myself. So regardless of all the books people are reading to try to improve their their uh, their time and and figuring out how to do this a little bit easier, actually getting out and talking with people and yeah. finding maybe a mentor, or finding someone that's been there before to just pick their brain is, is probably what, well, what's worked well for you, right? You know, and sometimes you can't find a mentor, but um, even books, right? So most people here have probably read The Startup Manual. It's one of uh, you know my favorite books by Steve Blank. Probably read that. Uh, you know, it talks all about uh, you know the formula of getting out there and talking to customers, figuring out exactly what they want, then figure out how to deliver that to them, as opposed to hey, this is cool tech, I wanna play with this and, and we'll make a product, right? Um, which is what a lot of people just tend to do. So um, yeah, that, that's definitely if, um, you know, if you don't have access to a mentor, um, just read books by people that haven't done it. And, and one thing that's interesting about those books is that um, a lot of those guys, I mean, you know, they were successful entrepreneurs, they exited or IPO'd, they don't make money writing books, <laughs> right? So the thing is, their marketing isn't that good on those books. You'd be really surprised that um, you know they're not out there promoting it because it's not how they make a living. They they just kind of wrote it really to help people and um, and yeah and I uh, and, and I was also very lucky to uh, meet some people in the startup community who had had some success like Corey Miller, Chris Byer, some of these guys that uh, you know are, are a couple years ahead of me and. Um, and they were really helpful. Danny Maloney, who you had on last month, uh, actually when the router failed, um, he was tremendously helpful. He was the one that was like, you know, why aren't you guys looking at the customers that are churning? You know, why aren't you looking at the ones that are really happy with your product? I was like, wow, that's good advice, Danny. <laughs> you know, so, so I wish, wish that was a whole book that I would have read, <laughs> you yeah. know, like, like pay attention to, to customer churn. So, um, yeah. It's funny how the sage advice doesn't necessarily come until after it's too late. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you're not ready to hear it. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. probably probably the case. It's, I know I know a lot of um, engineering-minded uh, people who have started companies uh, really from products they were interested in. You know, products they wanted to build. Um, and despite kind of the the cautions, it's not until after it fails, and they're like. Oh, I, I <laughs> should have should have listened to what people were saying, you know. So. Yeah. So, um, 
through all these challenges that you encountered, what really drove you to to push through them? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. You know, like kind of why do why do I keep doing this, right? Um, you know, and, and I don't really have a good answer other than I just I I'm an entrepreneur. You know, like I I when I see myself at you know mid 60s, early 70s, I'm still building stuff, right? I still want to be creating something right and and that's just that's just what i'm doing it's not you know um it's nothing more grand than that it's just i'm an entrepreneur i like to build stuff i like to build companies i think it's fun uh, i used to be kind of an artist i used to like create paintings and stuff and um so that was really fun and you know now with like products it's like that same concept except the things i make people get to use in their daily lives right so it feels kind of like that same creative you know, getting to build the world kind of aspect. And so I, I just, I really enjoy it. Um, yeah, so that's it. So you deal with a lot of government space of uh, libraries and businesses that are wanting to see analytics on who's on their Wi-Fi. Public parks, yeah, absolutely. Public parks, what, what type of advice can you give to other entrepreneurs that are in this space? And I'm sure it could, could go at length with like market, right? And, and how your market, ultimately defines your company to some degree more than I mean even more than to some degree like founder vision and, and all this um, you know your market is going to tell you how to sell to people how what you know what they really need what their problems are because again if, if you're not solving your problems you don't really have a company um, so government for instance um, government has its own challenges um, long lead times slow sales cycles um, often you need to make sure that you're talking to the right person that can actually make a decision and multiple people. So it's kind of got the, it's kind of got the aspects of enterprise sales like that, right? Um, so as far as someone selling to government, yeah, I'd say, um, be patient. <laughs> um, Hurry up and wait. To, to some degree, but have multiple, you know, because of that, don't have one deal that you're waiting on, right? Like if you have one deal that you're waiting on in government, it's it's a terrible place to be in because what happens if they say well oh, well I know it's 2018 but you know we're really going to put this in the 2019 budget and you've really been focusing a lot of energy and attention on it until the until that contract comes through but if you have 10 cities 10 states you, you know what I mean and you're working on on multiple um, you know whatever it is like government entities at the same time um, you know maybe one or two of them is going to be ready right now right and and other ones are going to wait uh, you know so so just have multiple going and that's kind of a way to to get past that that uh gap right so does that make sense yeah that's great that's great so it certainly seems like especially with the government space having a lot of irons in the fire is, is helpful yeah. to keep things going um do you what are, do you deal with any other types of spaces or has that kind of carved out your well, definitely, that's that's one of our. I mean, it's probably our, our biggest segment by far, right? Is is government and um, yeah. I, I mean, I could give advice on consumer, but since we kind of failed there, I won't. <laughs> I'm just say let people who have succeeded at consumer talk about that. Yeah. So, uh, how would you advise new entrepreneurs to maybe begin selling to government, or if if they're looking at maybe going down the route? Not necessarily uh, Wi-Fi analytics, but just targeting government segments. What? Sure. Um, what could they learn from you? Yeah, yeah. So there's, um, for one thing, there's uh, a lot of public information out there, which is which is really nice. Um, you know, if if let's say you're selling to, um, you know, police departments, et cetera, fig figure out everything about um, that market, right? So figure out, you know. Uh, who actually makes a decision about purchasing, right? So is it, you know, if, if it's the police department, well, is this police department managed by city IT? Or is the police department, do they have their own IT? You, you see what I mean? Like, yeah. like really kind of figure out who makes purchasing decisions, um, figure out who tends to say no to, to new initiatives, um, figure out what are the budgets. And I mean, because again, a lot of the stuff is actually public information, right? So, so you know, cities' budgets, County budgets, state budgets, federal budgets—these these are all 
public information because it's all public money, right? So, um, so yeah, you can you can find out all of those kinds of things, uh, and I'd say just learn as much as you can from from the customer. Uh, figure out the the you know don't just say well uh, we sell to police departments, so I know somebody at a police department. I'll talk to them. That could be nothing to do with their job, right? Like their their job is is completely unrelated to that. So. Um, so yeah, really find out specifically the jobs in uh, an organization uh, like the government. So, Does being located in Oklahoma City have any advantages or anything that uh, help you with more relationships with the government or? Um, no, <laughs> but, it, but it doesn't hurt us either, you know. Um, yeah, it, uh, uh, it's, it's kind of surprising to me. We actually, uh, most of our government customers are out of Oklahoma, we, we do have uh, some here, but the uh, the majority of them are outside of the state of Oklahoma. Um, so it's not it hasn't really been an advantage, but it hasn't been a disadvantage, right? And and I know that just being located, you know, in the U.S. is actually very helpful as opposed to if we were remote trying to, to sell into it. You know, there there are certain um, categories as far as um, you know they actually ask you know are you like, are you a U.S. business? Are you in the state, et cetera, right? So, so yeah, some of those things. So do you see any other opportunities on the horizon for you guys? Lots of them. Yeah, there's, there are a lot of opportunities. We're, um, we're starting to get some traction in property management, right? So this, this comes to, we're talking about a little bit more with like malls, et cetera. Um, you know, and, and again, it, it comes down to, um, if you can know where people are in a physical space, it can help you make better decisions, right? So um, everything from, well, yeah, so, so you're gonna rent a place in a mall, great. Um, they'll, they might tell you that, oh, we get, whatever, a few thousand visitors a day, right? Okay, does your space actually get a few thousand visitors a day, or does the mall? Because if everyone goes straight past all the stores, straight to the, the movie place, or to the, like, the, the food court, you know, and you're on the other side because most people enter this way and you're straight at the food court, why did you rent that space, right? And why are they charging the same amount? Do they know it's the same amount? You see what I mean? So, so again, just having better information about actual flows to it, um, that's kind of where we're seeing some, some initial success so far. So yeah, a lot, of, a lot of opportunity there. Exciting. And so before we get to the question and answer portion, is there any other sage advice that you'd like to give us or any inspiring entrepreneurs on uh, maybe uh, how, how they can maybe make it a little bit easier on themselves to start a business? Um, I, you know, as far as making it easy on yourself, like, I don't think that exists, <laughs> right? It's, 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 it's not easy. <laughs> it is hard. Um, maybe recognizing, recognizing that it's hard, recognizing that it's going to be hard, recognizing that you're probably not going to succeed, like, right away, but you might, right? I mean, and, and you know, I, I know we know of plenty of examples of, of people that, you know, they're hitting a million, two million revenue in like eight months, 12, you know, but, but that is definitely the exception to the rule. Um, you know, most people, it, it takes a while. You don't quite get the customer right. You don't quite get the product right. You, you know, you, you basically have to keep kind of failing and, and continuing. Um, so, you know, just being aware of how hard it is at the beginning. Um, not what like the news media <laughs> tells you, uh, you know, because those those uh, you know billionaire in six months those, that's great for news, right? Definitely sells a lot of newspapers, <laughs> right? Or, or gets a lot of clicks, a lot of views, but it's not um, it's not the reality. So I'd, I'd say just just be ready and good luck. <laughs> that's, that's what I'd say. Well, thanks, John. I really appreciate you sharing everything with yeah. with us. I'm sure a lot of us got. I know I personally got a lot of value out of that, especially with the government so segments. Guys. Yeah. Um, do you, any of you guys out in the audience, do you have any questions for John? Yeah, uh, A two-part question. When you started, did you, did you have initial investments or you just kind of worked it out on, on your own? Like, I got money saved up and I'm just going to quit my job and work on it? Sure, yeah. So, um, so I basically, I had money saved up. And uh, I was kind of working on um, some product ideas like nights and weekends, and it was, was making like $500 a month before doing the launch. So, you know, at the very least, I knew I wasn't going to go broke or starve from it, right? So, so definitely had some very basic income coming in uh, and some, some kind of customers. And uh, then I also had money saved up, yeah, and then I had about 
uh, a year or two's worth that I was like, okay, this is this is what this might be how long it's going to take, um, and yeah, and and that was definitely necessary. And then didn't really take a, a little bit of investment until uh, really it was at the router. And I was like, well, we're going to need some money to to buy hardware, get somebody on, etc. And that's when uh, I tried to do that. So. So, so that's the second part to my question. That, that yeah. you said it's routers, but um, as far as bringing on employees, yeah, what kind of, I guess, like ratio do you have uh, for like, uh, or do you have one for like income or revenue coming in and and, and adding employees and sure, yeah, you know, how much of that do you, what portion do you take of the revenue and what portion do you take in in like possible investments? Or, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's. Um, that's a really great question. I'd say it kind of changes over time. You know, it, um, definitely it seemed like in the beginning uh, was more willing to, well, let's use the revenue to reinvest in the company, right? And then, you know, what, what tends to happen to almost every company I've seen is around year three, like, wow, I really got to quit doing that, right? Because at that time, even if you're taking a, a modest salary or something like that, like, wow, this has been year three and still not making anything and like burning through savings. And, and I've got a lot of friends that started at about the exact same time I did. And, and everyone kind of hits that that um, nasty point at around two to three years, right? It's like you're, you're out of savings, you're, you're trying to figure out what to do, um, but you still want to grow the company, right? Because normally, normally if you make it past year one or year two, you probably found customers. You're, you're probably making some amount of money. It's a question of how much money are you making? What do you need to, to do next? And do you want to grow it, right? And that's that's kind of your your question. Like, like you're trying to grow it. Um, how much should you allocate towards new employees? How much should you allocate uh, towards paying yourself? I mean, definitely, if you're not paying yourself enough, you know, like to really live on. I mean, it doesn't mean you're 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 great or like you're you're really kind of loving your salary but if you're not paying enough to where at least you're covering your basics then something's wrong you need to like kind of kind of handle that because why why hire an employee but at the same time um or, or invest what you can either in um i wouldn't say i wouldn't say marketing or advertising yet because the real thing is like the first thing you have to get is that product market fit and it took us i mean it took us four years i'd say like four real years to get product market fit and we thought we had product market fit because we were making sales we were making revenue we had a product and we, were, we were out there we were getting customers right but it was completely unsustainable right because the the pricing models etc I was, I was kind of mentioning before so your first goal is to get to product market fit right um, then you can talk about scale. So, you know, because if, if your base costs plus the amount you're, you're making um, on top of that and, and kind of like your, your revenue can cover all of that, then you actually have money to either hire employees or spend on marketing, et cetera. If you don't have that, you know, really your only solution is to seek investment, right? And you're not really a great investment candidate. And the reason why is because you're not making any money, right? Like, it's, and so you might want to consider raising your prices, et cetera. Does that, does that make sense? Like, and, and that's what I'm saying. Um, when do you know when to hire an employee um, as opposed to just like founders, et cetera? I mean, it's, that's going to be specific to your business. Um, but I would, if I was doing it again, instead of doing it from investment, uh, I would probably wait until I knew we had product market fit, that we had kind of that, that scalable type solution where revenue minus um, marketing cost, minus sales cost, minus product cost still had a little bit left over to pay for you know, future growth or future marketing. You know, and once you hit that, um, whether you raise capital or whether you kind of more slowly do it from that extra amount, uh, that's a perfect time to hire an employee. And that's what we did in year four, right? So in year four, our, we increased sales first, and then from sales, we hired employees, right? In year two, we raised investment and hired employees. And year three was very rough, right? Um, does that make sense? Yeah. So, so that's what I would say, like, you know, the whole, it, you know, it, it seems like um, the startup is, it, you know, and this is why it's so hard to give generic advice on a company because every company is different, every market is different. Um, you know, people say like, you know, what your company needs marketing. Okay, what do you know about my company? <laughs> right? Like, if 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 
we have great marketing. And I mean, we had a million free users at one point, right? Like we literally had a million downloads um, and it didn't help us. So, so we were being covered in like Lifehacker and CNET and all this kind of stuff, and it wasn't helping us at all. And, and why is because um, really those people were churning very quickly or they were just kind of happy with the free app, right? So, so again, if somebody would have, and, and I'm sure I said this because I apparently like to make mistakes, I'd probably been like, oh, you know, we need to spend money on marketing, right? It's probably what I, right when I would have done it is right then. We already had, you know, tons of visibility. Um, but when we really needed to spend money on marketing is actually recently because we've gotten to product market fit, right? So, so your first job as a startup is get to product market fit, get to like actually delighting customers to where you can charge enough, et cetera. Then you can worry about scale. And if you're not, if you're not there yet, and it doesn't seem very obvious to scale, uh, I'd just be really cautious. That's all. I think your point about, uh, not having a, a generic answer for a specific startup is well said. I can't think of a better way to put that. Yeah, it's and, and, and I mean everyone's well-meaning and uh, generally speaking, and um, and a lot of times you know because you, you were talking about mentors, you know people can tell you what worked for them and what didn't work for them, but market dynamics are different. Right, like your market, even though we both sell the government, is very different than my market, right? And and people doing consumer B two B, et cetera, uh, consulting has a completely different path, right? So product based startups, apps, I mean, they're they're all so different. They all have their own kind of competitive areas. You've got competition, you've got the marketing that's involved, you've got you know how much it costs to produce, you've got all those different aspects to it. Um, you don't really want to compare, you know. Um, and actually, this, is, this just kind of kind of reminds me. Uh, I guess I'm sort of reminiscing now. Um, when I was at the 404, uh, I remember uh, there was somebody that was doing consulting, and uh, and, and then another person that was doing an, an enterprise uh, product company, like product based. So they were only making money from the product, and they were really mad because they'd been working on their product business for like three or four years, and they were making maybe I don't know. Four or five thousand a month, something like that, right? So, so you know, it, it was it was there, but it wasn't wasn't doing great. And uh, then there was a guy who was doing consulting in like year one, and you know, he was making like ten thousand a month or something, right? And and it's like, oh, why did I do this? But you know, those growth trajectories are just totally different. You know, as a consultant, you've been working on a product for twenty years, right? And there's so many man hours, and so it it tends to go up a little bit, but then it tends to flatten out your maximum revenue unless you hire employees. Right, it, where product-based companies, especially technical products, you know, try, if you can sell to one customer, you know, bytes cost very little money. Websites, cost, you know, database entries cost very little money. So getting the next 50 customers doesn't really cost you that much. And that, and that's kind of those hockey stick curves that people talk about. Mainly has to do with the product type companies. So just just be very aware that um, you know your company has a different growth trajectory than probably most of the other people that you know that are running companies, uh, especially if they're B2B versus consumer, versus consulting, versus et cetera. Uh, B2G has its own kind of growth. So just throw that out there. Thanks. So. Any other questions? I'm sorry, you asked that. I thought you asked that, but you <laughs> asked that, yeah. Ethan. Yeah. What was the biggest thing that you feel like you overhyped in your own mind? You know, I'm a I'm a classic en uh, engineer entrepreneur, so I definitely thought it was like, man, people are gonna love the product, <laughs> right? And and that is what's gonna change things, right? And um, and it's just never been the case, right? I mean, it's it's yes, you have a good product, but if you don't market it if you don't find people's problems and so to me that was kind of like you know oh it's it's we need to make the product better we need to make the product oh oh we've made this great product and i mean the the router is classic example i mean yes that's still i mean even with the the stuff we've built since the router that was still some of the sickest technology that that i was ever a part of anywhere right and um you know just great tech but no market, right? So, so again, from an overhyping standpoint, oh, this product's so great, everyone's gonna recognize the value of the product. And it just wasn't the case. So that's what I'd say. And you're a marketing guy, so you're probably laughing. <laughs> so. Tell me what you think of a software support business model. Um, 
Yeah, you know, we were, we were actually talking a little bit before about open source plus a support model. Um, you know, it, it it just depends, right? That's that's a big thing. Um, yeah, I was explaining the the company uh, Open Dental that uh, I forget how large they are now, but they started off with like uh, open source and kind of a, a B2B market in the dental industry. And, um, you know, they, they actually grew, but, but again, the people at dentist's office are not IT professionals. So uh, what they really charged for was ultimately almost like a commercial product. It just happened to be open source because, you know, um, most truck drivers, right? don't really care about open source. They're not gonna program on it, doesn't matter, right? So whether your product is open source or not, if you can, you know, if you can just solve their problem for however many thousand per month or per year, they'll pay it. It doesn't really matter because they don't care that your technology is open source. Um, and that's kind of the same thing, like whether you call it support or whether you call it a commercial product, uh, depending on the industry you're in, they might, it doesn't mean anything, right? Because um, it's kind of like if, um, I don't know, um, I can't think of a good analogy, but but something you know, I'm never going to do my own. Like, I'm not going to build my own house. I'm not. I'm not the kind of person that can just sit there and like, like, lay bricks and and whatever. So even if even if somebody gave me the schematics, they're like, man, we're an open schematic, you know, real estate company, right? Cool. Can you build a house for me? <laughs> right? Like, I just I would have no concept of great. Here's some schematics so I can lay my own bricks. Like, it just I wouldn't do it. So uh, it's, I think that's the same thing you'd find and. Uh, open source with service in industries that have nothing to do with technology. So, I think we've got time for one more question. As a uh, SaaS model, do you have a certain target of how many months of revenue you're willing to spend to acquire a, a user? Sometimes it's sure. two to four months worth of revenue. To yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, you definitely. You know, and that, and that kind of comes to this like product market fit aspect. You definitely want to figure out some of those metrics, your customer acquisition costs, as well as your lifetime value of the customer. Because again, this is this is something that that really burned us when we were working with consumers and, and selling to consumers. Um, they were turning so quickly that that the, uh, I mean, any customer acquisition over, you know, one month was like was was worthless to us, right? Um, and so, yeah, you, you just have to figure out what your numbers are. I mean, uh, it depends if, I mean, there, there are obviously large companies that can have lifetime values even of as low as um, $50 or $60, but because they have, you know, really solid large markets that have customer acquisition costs at less than five, they can scale huge, you know? And, and then there are uh, places that, or companies that, um, you know, seemingly have low customer acquisition costs, you know, maybe it's fifty dollars, twenty five, whatever, um, but they're constantly going broke just because they're they're not getting that that lifetime value is too close, right? Um, so it it um, it doesn't matter the one month revenue if they're only on one, for one month, yeah. but if they're gonna be on for nine months and you can you know use one month to acquire them, absolutely go for it. I mean do that a thousand times a day. So well, thank you, John, and thank you all for joining us and for the great questions. Uh, let's give John a round of applause. And